to be confined in prison without the benefit of parole for the rest of your natural life. Normally, we love young people, but these kids are beyond salvation. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 most evil kids in history. This awful, raging, eating feeling inside. I could feel it consuming my insides. For this list, we'll be focusing on young people who took up a life of crime and subsequently crossed one moral line or another. Our focus is primarily on people 18 and younger. Yes, surprising as it may be, there are more than a few cases of adolescents and teenagers going down a dark path. So you won't find the Menendez brothers here, since they were 21 and 18 years old at the time of their parents' murders. Number 10. Willie Boskett For some people, there just doesn't appear to be any option except crime. That's what Harlem native Willie Boskett seemed to think. He believed that, like his father, he himself would end up being a murderer. Between March 19th and 27th, 1978, the 15-year-old fatally shot three people, including one New York Transit employee. Boskett pleaded guilty but was initially sentenced to a mere five years in a youth facility. He later went on to accumulate a sentence of 82 years to life for assault, arson, and attempted escape from a correctional facility. Number 9. Josh Phillips I knew Josh and, and knew that he was uh, visibly uh, he, he was one of the nicest kids in the neighborhood. Is it right to call this an error in judgment? Back in November of 1998, a young girl named Maddie Clifton went missing in Jacksonville, Florida. A week after Maddie's disappearance, her body was found in the waterbed of 14-year-old Josh Phillips, who had beaten and stabbed her to death. Phillips has since claimed he regrets the incident, but with a life sentence on first-degree murder charges and no parole in sight, we doubt he'll be leaving prison anytime soon. In my own time, I believe I will find the forgiveness that I'm that will satisfy my heart. Number 8. Edmund Kemper I had no thoughts at all that Ed could do what he said he had done. Appearing well-adjusted can disguise some of your worst qualities. Then I began destroying inanimate objects, uh, valuables of mine and others. Then I began killing dogs, cats. For instance, young Edmund managed to convince psychologists at the Atascadero State Hospital that he was of sound mind, despite having killed his grandparents in the aftermath of an argument when he was 15. He called his mom after he killed his grandparents, his father's parents, and said, Mom, I just killed. What should I do? And she said, call the cops. He managed to avoid serving more than five years in prison and was released in 1969. But tragically, that allowed him to murder six female college students, his mother and his mother's friend, three years later. It goes without saying that appearances can be deceiving. So how come they get in a car with somebody at that time? She judged me not to be that guy. I didn't look like him. Number seven, Graham Young. Uh, and was really educating himself into being an extremely expert chemist. It's just unfortunate that the chemistry he was interested in was poisonous. Suddenly, tea seems a lot less appetizing now. Meet Graham Young, a native of Neesden in London, who had been fascinated with the effects of poison since his childhood. He'd slipped some antimony into his friend's sandwich. Williams would be off school for a few days with some mystery Vira, the doctors would say it was a virus or a bug. In 1962, Young was arrested after confessing to the attempted poisoning of his family, an act which included serving his own sister, T, laced with deadly nightshade. The teen underwent nine years of detainment in the psychiatric facility Broadmoor Hospital before he was released, only to later use his position as a quartermaster to poison approximately 70 people with tea, which earned him the nickname the Teacup Poisoner fitting, but unsettling. He should never have been let out of Broadmoor in the first place. I accept that he manipulated and was clever there. Number 6. Brian and David Freeman Siblings stick together, even in the face of a criminal investigation. Brothers Brian and David, the eldest children of the Freeman family, were also fervent neo-Nazis who resented their strict upbringing as Jehovah's Witnesses. The duo's resulting violent relationship with their family came to a head in February of 1995, when both brothers were apprehended for the murder of their parents and younger brother Eric. It kind of all came out in that one, that one second. 
I, I think about it. I, it just happened. Brian, David, and their associate slash cousin, Ben Birdwell, conspired to plead guilty and avoid the death sentence. They got their wish, but landed lifetime sentences in the process. I never thought about the consequences of anything I did at that age. I was impulsive. I didn't, didn't care about the future. Number five, Brenda Spencer. Not liking Mondays doesn't seem like a valid reason for murder. Yet this is supposedly the excuse 16-year-old Brenda Ann Spencer gave for committing a school shooting. On January 29, 1979, Ms. Spencer fired 30 rounds of ammunition at Cleveland Elementary School. The shots killed the school's principal and a custodian, while leaving eight children and a police officer injured. Upon surrendering to the police, Brenda pled guilty to two counts of murder and assault with a weapon, earning her a sentence of 25 years to life. This is the type of case where, in our view, she should never be released from prison. She should spend the rest of her entire life in prison for what she's done. Number four, John Venables and Robert Thompson. <laughs> Who, who did? Robbie. Why did he throw bricks at him? Mm -hmm. Back in 1993, a two-year-old Liverpool boy was kidnapped, brutally tortured, and left on train tracks to be bisected. The culprits were John Venables and Robert Thompson, a pair of students who happened to be cutting class that day and who happened to be no older than 10 years of age. The public was shocked when Venables and Thompson were brought to trial and given a minimum of eight years in detention before being released under heavy restriction. We're still not sure how we feel about the whole ordeal. Number three, Jesse Pomeroy. In March of 1874, 10-year-old Katie Curran went missing in South Boston. A month later, the body of four-year-old Horace Millen turned up in a marsh. Authorities turned their gaze to Jesse Pomeroy, a local teenager previously convicted of brutally attacking other kids. Convicted by the end of the year for murdering Curran, Pomeroy went down in history as the youngest person ever charged with first-degree murder in Massachusetts. He would spend the remainder of his life in solitary confinement before passing away in 1932. Number two, Mary Bell. The first thing that comes into your mind about Mary is her eyes. She's got very, very distinctive blue eyes, very attractive blue eyes, I suppose, but they are very distinctive and they can fix you with a stay. Hard lives make for hardened people, but this seems extreme. Over the summer of 1968, police in the Scotswood area of England's Newcastle upon Tyne investigated the separate murder of two toddlers, each killed via strangulation. By August, Local child Mary Bell and her friend Norma Joyce Bell were charged with both murders, though the ruling was ultimately manslaughter. While Bell's friend was acquitted, Bell herself would spend 12 years in prison based on diminished responsibility. She had certain things that one felt were missing in her emotions. That was my impression. It was ruled that Mary had symptoms of psychopathy and posed an uncontrollable threat to children. Given the circumstances, that doesn't seem like a bad call. She'd come out of it as a very balanced, sensible person and has sorted out her life with some ups and downs in it and I think has become uh, a very good citizen. Before we unveil our number one pick, here are some honorable, or in this case, dishonorable mentions. I wasn't thinking that, not, I mean, I wasn't like mad, mad at them or anything like, like that. Just, I feel like it just Happy. If I knew then what I know now, I would have never have been there. I would have stopped everything from happening, and I would have never let Shanda be picked up. Shirley writes in a journal, We killed an old lady today, and it was fun. Number one, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. No, you goddamn piece of punk-ass shit! Do not mess with that friggin' kid! If you do, I'll rip off your goddamn head! We've seen more than a few school shootings in history, such as those perpetrated by Mitchell Johnson and Andrew Golden, Jamie Rouse, Kip Kinkle, and Barry Lukaitis. But the one orchestrated by these two is by far the most traumatizing. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, a pair of troubled teens from Columbine, Colorado, began preparations in 1999 to lash out against society. 
The duo marched into Columbine High School on April 20th, carrying homemade bombs and various firearms, proceeding to kill 13 people and injure 24. To top it off, Harris and Klebold simultaneously committed suicide as police entered the school, ensuring that the pair could not be brought to justice. These two kids did not come out of their mother's womb hating. What happened from the time they were born to the time that they carried out this? Do you agree with our list? What sinister kids gave you goosebumps? For more emotionally charged top tens published every day, be sure to subscribe to WatchMojo.com. How did you get the knowledge to outsmart the police? Watching television, believe it or not.